Busting. I'm your host, Jay Light. Joining me today, Julie Seabaugh. Yay, thanks, Jay. Thanks I appreciate you having Julie. me. It's very exciting to have you. You're celebrating 15 years in comedy journalism this uh, this year. Woohoo, yes. A month ago, right? Officially? Uh, well, th- what day is this? A third? Yes. Um, recording on the, on the fourth, actually. The fir- Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Hey. Came in early to knock this thing out before the big game. I, that's football, right? Yeah, it's some football. <laughs> I uh, I am not a fan of either of the teams that are in the Super Bowl, but I feel like I'm fitting along with the majority of the country in saying that, too. I, th- I think that some of the one or both are not liked. Is that what's happening? Mostly. here. So it's the Patriots and the Eagles. The Patriots are always seen as kind of like elitist fans who are mad perpetually that their team gets uh, fucked over by the league, even though they've they've won, a, a, what, five Super Bowls at this point, and they are a, a team that is continually dominant, and they're like, oh, we get fucked over all the time. That's, a, not, that's not a Boston accent. I don't know what that was. Uh, <laughs> I was convinced. And then we also have the Eagles, who have... Uh, Never been a Super Bowl champion. Uh, last time they were in the Super Bowl at all was, uh, I think, 2005. And their fans are crazy. Um, they, before their last playoff game, the cops in Philadelphia went and greased up the poles for, uh, like, street uh, stoplights. That's what those things are called. Uh, so that way the fans could not climb up the poles. And, of course, they still figured out a way to anyway. Ah, so. okay. See, this Morgan Murphy Twitter joke that she made about greasing poles makes so much more sense now. Yeah. Now you got the context. Oh, uh, yeah. That's funny. I take it you will. You're, are you planning on going to watch the game anywhere? No. Uh, I'll be taking a nap and I'll be preparing for some stuff tomorrow, doing some transcribing of an interview I did last night and some yoga. And, uh, yeah, full day ahead. It's a Sunday. Uh, you know, there, I guess there's sports happening, but there's also comedy sports in my own mind. There's a lot of that comedy I'll be competing happening. with. Yes. I get it. Let's, well, let's, uh, let's, let's jam right into these movies. Uh, so this week, first up, box office news, courtesy of Box Office Mojo, Jumanji tops Super Bowl weekend in $855 million worldwide. So, uh, Jumanji comes back to take the number one spot uh, once again this week. $11 million over the weekend. It's this seven weeks in. It's doing business. I have not seen uh, anything that you're going to name on this list. I, Phantom Thread was the last thing I saw, which is pretty I great. I love Phantom Thread. Oh, so good. So good. I, I relate to that whole troubled genius thing. Yeah. Me, me too. <laughs> I feel like more people who are in comedy should see that movie, and I feel like a lot of comedians are going to write it off because they're like, it's a movie about a fashion designer, and then they're going to – and then. but if you go see it, it's like, no, it's about – it's about art. It's about what you give up in your personal life or don't allow yourself to experience in your personal life for yeah. your art. I get that conversation when they had the fight about the tea that she brought. Like, I've had that one numerous mm. times. Mm. That hit a little too close to home. It's yeah. about sacrifice and power and control. Ugh. They have all the things that all the things that make your art uh, in, inaccessible to the people that you love, and only to people who are uh, your fans, and like who you can actually let into your world. That's not going to completely derail you from your task that you've been given in your gut that you have to carry out. And yep. it's, and then there's uh, some mushrooms too. Yeah. Oh yeah, the very different kind of mushrooms from what most comics would probably take, though. Jumanji has none of that. I've seen Jumanji. It's pretty bad. I don't know why. I said this last week. I don't know why everybody is praising Chumanji as the second coming of of 21 Jump Street. I mean, The Rock's like an artistic genius, too. He has these trouble, right? I'm Probably. <laughs> you know, I would love to see uh, if The Rock in a very serious Paul Thomas Anderson movie. <laughs> if The Rock became our next Daniel Day-Lewis... Somehow, that's a career renaissance I can get behind. Somebody's got to fill that gap now. Yeah. 
He's retiring allegedly. He oh yeah, the, he said Phantom Threads is his last uh, film role, and I the, the void needs to be filled for somebody who's going to be incredibly serious and in their role constantly on set. You know, we need somebody who's going to go out to Italy and go make shoes for five years instead of taking on any acting roles. The Rock. Yeah, I think The Rock could do it. <laughs> the, the Rock, he's going to make bespoke wrestling gear. That's that's what his, his – he's going to go down to Mexico. He's going to go find whatever. He's going to go buy a factory, make some luchador garb, but all hand-stitched, handcrafted. And then somebody's going to come to him and be like, Mr. Mr. The Rock, we would <laughs> like you. We think you'd be perfect for this role. And you get to keep your tribal tattoos. You know that's his, in his stipulations for his contract for most of his movies now, right? He he doesn't have to cover his tattoos up? I cannot say I was aware of that. No, that is my fun fact for the day. Less less know. fun, I guess. It's but. it's uh, it's uh That's some industry, industry insider info for you. I'm just waiting for him to try comedy. One of these days. I mean, all the other. He's there's so a- many wrestlers and all, fighters and it's a matter of time. If he doesn't wind up running for president, I think he's probably going to take to stand up. Jeez. It's got to be, look, it's one of those two options. Because I feel like the, the, it's, it, if you're a politician, you could just as easily try doing stand up and still get the same kind of rush out of it, but without any of the actual stakes of having to, you know, get people to like you on a grand scale. You can just do it on a more micro scale. He'd be a fun one to roast in a roast battle. Yeah. A lot of material to work with there. Well, he did that one for the the roast with the troops. Uh, He did a roast battle against old Jeff Ross. Was that on a sports TV thing? It was on Spike TV. You know, TV for men. Oh, yes. The form. All right. Rest in peace, Spike TV. No longer exists. It's been replaced by the Paramount Channel. Oh, right, right. With Waco. Uh, Too much to keep track of. There's a lot. There's too many things. You know what else there's too much to keep track of? Sequels to The Maze Runner. Maze Runner 2, The Death Cure. Sorry, Maze Runner 3, The Death Cure. I can't even remember how many sequels there are. Number two at the box office, dropping from number one, $10 million. Young adult stuff, it's there. It's still out there. Future dystopian weirdness. Uh, yeah, for the listeners at home, I'm staring at Jay blankly right now. That's how I feel blank inside right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Number three is the only new entry to the top ten this week, Winchester, a horror movie about the Winchester Mystery House that's uh, in California, not too far from here, I don't think. Oh. You familiar with the legend of the Winchester Mystery House? No, but I know that The Exorcist was based in St. Louis, where uh, I'm from Missouri, so that's like a thing. I'd, I don't like horror movies. I haven't even seen Get Out, even though I definitely should. You haven't seen Get Out? I, I don't like scared. And I really love Catherine Keener, and I don't want to be scared of a movie she's in and being weird. There was one she did with, um, oh, what's her, uh, the girl who, uh, oh, jeez. Uh, it was called uh, American Crime, I want to say, and it's horrific. And uh, she basically imprisons a girl in a basement, and she dies. And I don't want to think that way about Catherine Keener ever again. I feel like I read about that movie <laughs> when I was diving down a Wikipedia hole someday. Occasionally, I dive down into Wikipedia holes about horror movies and horrifying incidents. Um, and that seems that sounds familiar. That rings a bell. It's just very disturbing. I'm still getting freaked out thinking about it right now. Juno, who's the actor who plays Ellen Juno? Page? Yes, Ellen Page is the girl that she kills in the basement. And, oh boy! Oh, oh boy! No. Uh, this movie appears to be much less uh, torturing girls in basementy. This is about a house where. It was believed to be haunted, and so the lady who owned the house decided to keep expanding it, and so she built stuff like stairs that go into the ceiling and doors that open directly into walls to try and confuse the ghosts. Right. Okay. I see the logic. And that's about all I know about the house and all I know about the movie. Uh, it made nine and a quarter million dollars at the box office this week, number three overall. Wow. I'm not going to watch it, but now I have questions about like, so is the movie about the woman building all this weird stuff and trying to confuse the ghosts and what happens? Or is it before anything's built and there's the original story that this is playing and then the woman builds stuff after? Like, what's the... I'm not going to watch it. I'm not going to watch it either, <laughs> and I don't even really want to find out because I just it's just one of these, like, January horror movies that is that doesn't seem to be any good. It's not getting good reviews. I think it hopefully will fall out sooner rather than later 
in the box office. <laughs> Number four, still holding on strong, The Greatest Showman. Oh, that's Hugh Jackman. Right. Yep, it's P.T. Barnum. Newsflash, haven't seen that either. It's okay. Me either. No <laughs> desire to. The, the, you know, this movie, the 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 way that it's advertised really gets me because it's it's doing that thing that so many more movies are doing now where they're like, from the producer of blank, and it, this one is from the lyricists behind La La Land. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you cho- it's look, I understand one thing if it's like from the director of X movie, for the writer of X movie because it's like those people made a, a creative stamp, you know, it's their movie. If you're seeing a movie that's from like from the producer, the I see this all the time now, from the producers of Get Out. Okay, great. So they make horror movies. You're just trying to capitalize on a on a very popular movie. Mm. What are you doing? But I feel like dumb people will be just be like, oh, yeah, for sure. But it's a musical, right? So I guess that would be relevant in this case. I mean, Is it a musical? Relevant. It's a musical, okay. but it's also like from the lyrics, from the people who wrote this, <laughs> these La La Land songs. It's just, I don't know. It just bugs me. From it's the a- best boy grip from Phantom Thread. <laughs> from the, the, from the cater- title designer behind Fight Club. <laughs> the Rock's caterer. <laughs> Uh, the rocks, the rocks caterer sounds like, uh, the biopic that we all need to see (laughs) one of these days, Tuesday, Tuesdays with Maury and the rocks caterer, both written from the writer of (laughs) the five people you meet in heaven. (laughs) Um, number five of the box office is hostels, Western extraordinaire, apparently doing business, got five and a half million dollars. Coming with uh, Christian Bale and Timothy Chalamet and uh, Rosamund Pike from Gone Girl. So that's hostels as in like an aggressive attitude as opposed to hostels like a place where poor European teenagers stay when they're backpacking across Correct. the country? Okay. Yes. Not not in the Eli Roth. This is not in the Eli Roth hostels universe. Mm. This is the this is the old West uh, Native American, the, the, the engines hostels universe. Oh, um, okay. and it looks, yeah, it looks like it's something set in the civil war era times. I haven't seen it. It looks good. Apparently it's getting good reviews, but I have not gotten around to it. There does seem to be like a good variety of stuff though. You got a horror movie, you got a Western, you got a musical, you got the rock. Yeah. Uh, what else do we have available currently in theaters? We got the post. Steven Spielberg's oh, movie yes. about newspapers. I do want to see this. <laughs> oh, God. You journalists have seen the <laughs> newspaper movies. Um, I, you know, we, because Spotlight was what, two years ago? I'm trying to fee- I'm trying to think if now, because of the success of Spotlight, if we're going to have a journalism movie every year. Because I can't think of a, a movie genre that seems more boring on paper. <laughs> Than following the life of a journalist. Literally on paper. Oh, yeah. God, you got me there. Uh, the only movie about journalism that seems to have any kind of real interest is Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. <laughs> That's all about journalism. It's more about drugs, but yeah. But yeah, you know, drugs and journalism go hand in hand when you're talking about Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> That's just... That's just, you know, part and parcel. That's have, what he does. Have you seen my Hunter S. Thompson tattoo? No, you have a Hunter S. Thompson tattoo? I'm uh, I'm turning around in my chair right now to show Jay the back of my neck. Oh, look at that. I see it. I see a little tiny bit of it poking out there. It's a red, uh, it's the gonzo fist where it's uh, clutching the peyote button. Nice. When'd you get that? Uh, let's see. I believe I was still in St. Louis at that time. I'm going to say maybe... 2005? I've got five t- tattoos. I, I can't keep track of anything anymore. I gotcha. This is right, this is right as you're, uh, you're, you're either, you're, what's the word? You're eking your way into, uh, into, tr- into comedy journalism at that point. Yeah, journalism is still more of a mainstream thing and actual career opportunity at that point. After the 2007, 2008 financial crash, not so much. 10 years in the past haven't been so great, but boy, that 2005, I sure had hope. Yeah, because that's <laughs> all you got. Uh, 12 Strong coming in number seven, movie about horse soldiers, still in there. A lot of variety. I don't even... 
If you ever thought, you know, I wonder, I've always loved movies about the war in Iraq, but there haven't been enough horses in them. Let's go check out 12 Strong. You can finally marry your two loves. Yeah, I'm more blank staring again. I've been skittish on horses in war movies ever since I saw Lawrence of Arabia and hated that movie. Was it because it was way too long? Way too long, and it's just, it's so boring. <laughs> and it's its just not good. It's its one of those movies we watched, I in film school we watched that as part of a cinema aesthetics class where we had to watch all these movies. They're like, oh, this is one of the, you know, some visually striking movies. And the whole point of that movie is that one snap at it between when he blows out the flame and then it cuts to the sunset. But then we're sitting there, all of us are in the theater at school watching it for like three hours. And then we come out and the next day in class, there was an uproar. We were so <laughs> mad at our teacher for making us watch that. We were like, that movie was the dumbest movie any of us have ever seen. It's a classic though. It's what you're supposed to watch it in film school for a reason. Right. I guess. But I don't know. There's other movies that I wish I'd watched instead. There are other visually interesting movies that I really enjoyed watching at that time. You know, we watched The Shining for that class. Mm. We watched Touch of Evil for that class. Very good stuff. But Lawrence of Arabia just didn't cut it for me. And it, ever since then, horses and war movies have been spoiled. <laughs> I'm not about it. Uh, number eight, Den of Thieves, 50 Cent, etc. Stealing stuff from a bank. No I, idea what you're talking someone about. Someone call that robbing a bank. I call it stealing stuff. Uh, number nine, The Shape of Water. Oh, uh, no, I do know what that is. Yep. Have you? You haven't seen it yet, though. No, I have not. Shape of Water, good movie, not amazing. I think it's uh, kind of fallen into sort of Lady Bird syndrome, where it's a little overhyped. Um, I do think, it, although it's not my favorite, I do think it's probably the front runner for Best Picture right now. Interesting. Yeah, it just won, uh, I believe it just won the Producers Guild Award, which is usually a pretty good signifier for what's going to win at the Oscars. Um, it's got Guillermo del Toro is probably going to win Best Director as well. Um, but we'll see. You know, my vote's, my vote's for Dunkirk. If I were a member of the Academy, I'd be voting Dunkirk in all categories. I like that Phantom Thread. Phantom Thread's really good. <laughs> just, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson can't go wrong with that guy. And it's the only thing I've seen. Um, Paddington 2, you haven't seen that? Because that's number 10 at the box office. It's well, still clinging on. I haven't seen the first one, so I obviously can't. See, that's what I thats what I thought. But all of my friends who've seen Paddington 2 have said, hey, guess what? You don't need to worry about it for the continuity. Just remember <laughs> that there's a little bear. Okay, good. I was very worried about that. So I uh, will keep that in mind and still not see it. <laughs> there, you, That's the easiest way to solve all these problems. Um you know, this is uh, my probably my favorite news story that we've covered so far. By the way, in in this entirety of a running pop is, uh, the pod, blah, blah, the podcast, I can't talk today. Uh, the entirety of running the podcast, my favorite news story it comes to us courtesy of IndieWire today. Nicholas Cage can now be put into any movie in history thanks to a machine learning algorithm. Boy, that's not the news I thought you were going to lead with at all. No, this is what we're, <laughs> we're starting off with the lighter note. We're going, we'll get into some heavy stuff in a sec. Uh, so here we go. Um, there's this trend in the past few years that's come out. Uh, I, I'm not sure if about uh, neural networks. Have you heard about these? Um, you seen these? Have you heard about these? Have you is, seen these? Is that how they did Gollum? No, that's uh, that's all CGI stuff. So uh, okay. This is a thing that like. Basically, they're 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 making computers smarter, and it's terrifying because they can figure out stuff in uh, as far as like how to map people and how to and how to create art and generate pictures and stuff. Now there's somebody who's figured out how to create software that puts Nicolas Cage's face on <laughs> anybody else's face in any movie. <laughs> Uh, so a piece of software known on the internet as fake app utilizes an algorithm that makes it possible to scan a celebrity's face and upload it onto pre-existing video content. So naturally people have begun inserting Nicolas Cage into every movie on the planet. <laughs> so we've got a little, uh, there's some videos including, uh, here on the, on the, on the article of, uh, let's see, we got <laughs> Nicolas Cage in... Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> it's very horrifying. Uh, Nicolas Cage in Batman versus Superman, I think. Uh, as as Lois Lane. <laughs> yep, there you go. 
Ah, Nicholas he, Cage is Lois Lane. He's kind of cute. Nicholas Cage is Lois Lane. Yeah, he's got it. He's he, you know he can pull it off. I think that long hair really works for him. He was supposed to be Superman at one point in that like Doomsday movie, wasn't he? Yeah, that was a while back. I think. Yeah. It was back in that was back in like the height of Nicolas Cage's powers before he started being cast only in insane person roles. <laughs> I think that was yeah, that was definitely maybe around the time of National Treasure. It didn't wasn't Kevin Smith supposed to direct it or yeah. write it or something? Yep, Kevin Smith was supposed to direct and probably write. It was probably he, he'd probably doing all the things. That's the last movie news I remember. It sounds like I don't like movies. Um, it does sound like you don't like movies. You don't pay attention to them. You don't watch well, them. <laughs> but here's here's the thing though. Like I used to really love movies, and I even worked in a movie theater in college and saw everything. And was writing about movies before I just uh, discovered stand-up comedy. Oh, yeah? Yes, yes. And then Dave Attell shifted my entire world, and I can't even – I haven't seen anything in the top ten at all now. How did that happen? What did uh, what did Dave Attell do? Uh, he came and did a show at the University of Missouri when I was at the journalism school there. And uh, this is during the height of Insomniac on oh, Comedy yeah. Central. I would stay up late many nights to watch Insomniac. Yeah. And I had uh, I grew up on a farm in Missouri and didn't have cable. I had like four channels. So when I went to college and finally had cable for the first time and, uh, you know, was seeing all this stuff on Comedy Central. Uh, and then he was coming to do a show and I interviewed him over the phone. And then some of us took him out to drink afterwards because, again, this was the height of Insomniac. Yeah. And, uh, you know, flash forward to waking up on my friend Dan's floor, completely drunk, sick, and like, I, I like this comedy thing. I, I, I think there's something to this. So that was uh, my whole transition from watching every movie that ever came out and knowing a lot about what was happening to, yeah, just uh, being obsessed with stand-up comedy all the time. That's a good, I mean, that's a good obsession switch. What happened to me was, I mean, I was I went, I was a film student, and I was doing stand up at the time, and I basically thought that film was going to be just the day job, and I figured I'd move out here to L.A. and I would work in production and you know do PA gigs and see what happened there, and then I wound up with jobs at comedy clubs, and so the path to stand up just became more direct, you know, less clutter in the way. It was really nice, but it's good to have those skills though. I mean, yeah. you can definitely use it in a lot of different ways to, uh, you know, help shape your career and others. For mm -hmm. sure. Oh, for sure. And, you know, it's good to have a little bit of knowledge and editing and how to set up the cameras and, and shooting. You know, it helps out with roast battle. I can I can figure out how to I'm like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, we should frame a shot like this for the Periscope <laughs> stream. Uh, we should try and figure out how this should be edited together. So it's a little bit shorter. You know, we're going to start doing for the roast battle, uh, what for verbal violence for the website, we're going to start doing highlight reels. We're going to start doing Ooh. some of the top jokes of the month. Nice. Yeah. So now it's a good time to bring those back with my rudimentary Final Cut Pro skills. <laughs> Thank goodness. Uh, all right. Let's go to the other big news of the week. Uh, this just came out yesterday. We got a big article about it this weekend in the New York Times. Uh, bring him back. Classic segment on the podcast this week in Hollywood Predators. <laughs> this is uh, Uma Thurman finally coming out this week and bringing to light some of the uh, complaints and issues that she has had uh, with Harvey Weinstein. Now, when the Harvey Weinstein scandals first started to pop up, uh, you might remember she had... Uh, a very sort of cryptic Instagram post where she was like, you know, sort of like a chickens are coming to roost kind of thing. She posted stills from Kill Bill and basically said that she is angry, but she'll talk when the time is right. And now she's talking, talking stories, talking about what Harvey Weinstein did to her, but also talking about a little abuse she suffered at the hands of Quentin Tarantino on oh, set. Oh, dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. So is this, uh, is this something you're a little bit more up to date on? You seen these? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I do read actual news, and it's it's one of these things of, and we're going to get into this in my film that I talk about here, and also, uh, you know, the, the common thread of like, oh, yes, I want to see the post. Uh, journalism is still important in my mind as a journalist, uh, the New York Times, great work. Maureen Dowd is one of the best journalists today. And you could tell that they 
took their time and did it properly. This isn't like babe.gov or whatever. Oh, I think it just... I, <laughs> babe.gov. I just stole the... It's ge- been a conspiracy all along. I just stole the... Julie gen- Seabot breaking a, it. stole the Jenna Friedman joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> she actually is... Um, I totally did. Uh, she's on Conan this week, and she was running her set last night, and I'm about to write about her. Uh, she has a joke about, yeah, babe dot, I don't, org dot, cc, loss, what, like, basically illustrating the point that the Aziz Ansari story, while very unsettling, uh, would have been better if it was legitimate journalism. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, boy, howdy, this, uh, I, I think the allegations, uh, you know, the things she said about Harvey are not entirely t- surprising to anyone reading at this point. But, yeah, the Tarantino stuff, it just opens a whole new – okay, mm-hmm. so this is more getting into the culture of, you know, using women as, I guess in this particular case, like a tool for making the movie. has to get the perfect shot even if she's in danger and not listening to her hesitations. And, yeah, this is going to be – going on this is going to be a long discussion this is only like day one of it yeah this is going to be very long discussion because what the 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 biggest uh the crux of this new york times article i would say as far as the tarantino stuff is the car crash right um so what if you haven't read up on it yet i would encourage you to read this uh this article this is a very very well written article very enlightening um, you know, the Harvey Weinstein stuff, again, it's old news at this point. It's definitely gl- – I'm glad that it's still staying relevant, especially given that Harvey Weinstein also is maybe thre- going to threaten uh, Uma Thurman with legal action, which doesn't make sense to me. Oh, get um, out of here. It's going to be ridiculous Please. if he tries that at all. But so on Kill Bill, there was a moment when Uma Thurman was uh, – Put in a situation where she was told to drive a car for a scene that wound up being unsafe to drive. It was not properly outfitted as a stunt car, uh, and she was in a car accident. And she'd been told this by the people who, like, prepared the car or worked on it. Like, there were a lot of people who said, I don't think you should drive this. Yeah. But, but Tarantino says, oh, you got to hit 40 miles an hour or your hair won't blow the right way. A <laughs> uh, very, very phantom thread, woodcocky kind of uh, thing to say. <laughs> um, but definitely, but then she was in a car accident. She was injured. She had to go to the hospital. Uh, she had to go. She was in a neck brace. She had her knees damaged. She had a concussion. And this... This is a story, you know, I think that is very important to start covering now because it doesn't – it's not a uh, – it's not an abuse in the way that we've already been covering in the news over the course of the past several months. God, it's so weird to say that sentence over the course of the past several months. Uh, it's not It's not that specific kind, but it's a very other specific kind of abuse that I think is wor- – that is, that is just as important to talk about and the way – women are treated on set in the way that uh, they're kind of tossed around. Yeah. Yeah. There's like a lot of, uh, and what was the other example they used? There was actually one from the exorcist too. in in that article, wasn't there about uh, how it, um, it might not have been what uh, I think the second exorcist, it said where she was hanging off a ledge and there wasn't a lot of, uh, like, maybe she didn't have a safety harness or there weren't proper precautions in place. But she was really dangling off of something and could have. And there were a few other examples in this article of uh, putting women in danger uh, under the auspices, I guess, of I'm the director, I'm in charge. Um, I. I would dare to venture a guess that it's not necessarily only women, um, but it's relevant in Uma's case, obviously, uh, which is why she brought it up. Uh, so it's, yeah, there's a lot of going on in here. There's there's so many inroads to figuring out, like, how to address. There's a Me Too aspect. There's a safety on film sets aspect. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Like I said, this is just the beginning. We're just 
day one of all this. Yeah. Well, especially, I think the sa- the safety aspect on film sets really is started to come across and, di- and directly intersected with the Me Too movement with the Eliza Dushku allegations a couple weeks ago. Right. Um, with the stuntman. And, you know, that's a situation where, again, somebody was put in a situation that was unsafe and wound up injured. And you just... You just can't do that. Yeah. You know, that's why you have people who are trained on set to be in a, in a dangerous situation and they can protect you in situations like that. And when you go against having those protections in place, that is, I don't know. It's just not, it just doesn't come across as ethical filmmaking. And there's also the layer that, you know, Uma is saying, and I guess this might have been the case with Eliza too, of uh, that these very specific incidents, it was not necessarily lapse of safety, but the directors or the people in charge, um, the stuntman in Eliza's case, whoever is making the actors do these things, it's a form of wielding power. Right. It might not necessarily be about just getting the shot, but, like, I'm in charge. You have to do what I say. Right. Whatever the context. And that kind of comes across in the Uma Thurman article, too, because not only does a car crash happen, you also find out that for some of those scenes in Kill Bill, uh, for instance, where she gets spit on, Quentin Tarantino is the one doing the spitting. When right. she gets choked, Quentin Tarantino Tarantino's the one doing the choking. So at that point, the abuse of power becomes just as uh, as obvious and comes more clearly into focus. And, of course, it may or may not be stemming from the fact that he knows about Harvey treating her the way that Harvey has and Quentin's not stepping up to defend her or put a stop to it and she knows that he knows and he knows that she knows and it's all just a get in the car. <laughs> There's a big web. Yeah, there's a big old sp- there's a big old spider web of of abuse that is really the this these cobwebs are starting to uh they're just showing themselves you know we got the we got the flashlights all up in this place this is an attic that is full of danger and spiders and <laughs> somebody's got to clean this bitch out yeah I mean I what do you think is gonna happen with Tarantino I have no idea see that's the thing I don't know if anything is going to happen to Tarantino specifically I think. Because this is a again, this is a different kind of abuse of power than has been covered in the news so far in this course of this whole movement coming to light. Um, if there are other incidents like this that other actors and actresses come out about and bring to light, then he's going to be put into a place where he's going to have to do a, a, a pretty – massive public apology and because the thing is he already had come under scrutiny during the initial outing of the harvey weinstein right the stories because he had worked with him for so long you know miramax and and quentin tarantino go hand in hand their his entire i mean his entire body of work practically has been released under miramax and weinstein so you know it's one of those things that i think is going to just have to it's going to have to be uh, more stories are going to have to come out. And this is one of those things where his side of the story is going to have to, he's going to, he's got more explaining to do, you know, he's already had a little bit of explaining to do and it came across as whatever degree of woke you'd like it to come across as, but now there's stuff that directly involves him and Quentin Tarantino's got to, he's got a, He's got to do something. He's got to do. He's got to do some explaining. Yeah, the, if you're just looking the other way at Harvey's behavior, I guess would be one thing. But when you're, like you said, kind of mixing up filmmaking in this web of <laughs> your female star is very uncomfortable, and you're pressuring her to do stuff that she doesn't want to do, and she gets injured in the process because of the fact that you're more or less covering up and going along. Yeah, that's just – oh, boy. Yeah, that's Blair. a whole new level of you're, – you're, you're taking your douchebaggery to new and exciting places. Yeah, allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's talk – from uh, let's. This is a great time to segue out of talking about uh, dangerous filmmaking to just straight up bad filmmaking. <laughs> uh, Julie 
Today, you have come on to talk some shit about uh, 2015 American romantic comedy film Trainwreck, <laughs> uh, directed by Judd Apatow, written by Amy Schumer. The film is about a hard-drinking, free-spirited young magazine writer named Amy Townsend, who has uh. a first serious relationship with a prominent sports doctor named Aaron. Got some critical acclaim. Did it? 86% on Rotten Tomatoes. No. It grossed over uh, $110 million at the box office domestically. Fake news. Nominated for Best Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy at the Golden Globe Awards. Get Best the Act hell out of here. Best Picture, Musical, or Comedy. Uh, nominated <laughs> for Best Kiss at the MTV Movie Awards. And yet... <laughs> I you hate it. I didn't know it had like a claim. I should have looked that part up. It's all good. What do you, what do you hate about this movie? What do you hate about Trainwreck? Okay. Well, I mean, I will start out saying uh, I was really looking forward to it the first time I saw it. When it came out, I think I saw it opening weekend with my friend Miriam Katz, who's a fellow comedy journalist. We're all, yes, Amy's going to be a female journalist and it'll be funny. It's her first big film, make, film role. Uh, you know, this could be a star making vehicle. The story of how Apatow heard her just kind of talking about her life on Howard Stern and wanted to work with her was pretty interesting because uh, it's like you're going to get her, you know, her, her original vision, uncensored. What, she's get, what is she going to do writing her first movie? Let's go see it. Great. <laughs> and uh, I mean, also, like, she was uh, – Obviously famous already, semi-famous from uh, having Inside Amy Schumer on Comedy Central. Yep. A lot of new young teenage girl fans uh, that I think was very helpful for comedy. Uh, a segment that hadn't been uh, represented quite as in, in as large a scale at that point. Uh, Apatow doesn't have the greatest track record of, you know, female roles, but maybe it'll be funny like 40-year-old virgin, less unfunny like funny people but uh and the cast was just insane uh you know you had colin quinn as her dad uh, dave attell as a bum when he was like newly skinny yeah <laughs> um jim florentine robert kelly i'm reading a list here colin at this point. quinn is great bill Hader's great brie larson burbiglia before she gets her oscar and so many comics in this movie john glazer keith uh, robinson marina franklin pete davidson i'm still reading you got dan soder in there for a hot second leslie jones pete davidson nikki glazer bridget everett with Really big hair talking about being tag teamed by Tim Meadows. <laughs> that was <laughs> so it's like, yeah, okay, this, this list like seems like it's gonna work. Uh, there was also like Chris Rock's top five, I think he did that, yeah. where it's like, hey, we have all these cool little cameos and inside jokes. Like Attell's bum was named Gnome, who was the old uh owner of the comedy cellar oh, in yeah. New York. And yep. there's um, when Leslie Jones is standing on the subway, uh, the woman behind Amy that Amy accidentally bumps is Esty, who's the booker oh, of really? the comedy cellar. Hey, it's like, that a fun little cameo. Yeah. And so it's all set up for like comedy geeks. And then at the same time, you have all these sports figures. You're LeBron James and John Cena and Tony Romo. You got Marv Albert. You got... Uh, Omari Stoudemire. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, okay, so dudes will watch it too. We got, like, everyone's going to come see this thing. And, like, even Tilda Swinton, who I, the first time when I watched it, didn't even recognize. Yeah. Had oh. no idea she was in it until I, the end. I, same th same here. I was like, oh, wait, that's Tilda Swinton. Oh, this yeah. is crazy. Like, long hair and a weird hoity-toity magazine editor accent. And uh, Daniel Radcliffe, Marissa Tomei, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so yeah, the first 20 minutes, uh, going in, I actually thought were really funny. Um, there's the whole Colin Quinn has the whole speech about talking to young Amy and her sister. Monogamy isn't realistic. All this funny stuff about, I hate your mother and she hates me and yeah, I want to bang all her friends. And it's funny actually in the movie. Um, when Amy's at the, her magazine, she has this rant about, I just think sports are stupid. Anyone who likes them is a lesser person, has a small intellect. I laughed and laughed at that. Uh, happy Super Bowl, everyone. <laughs> uh, right, last, night I, last night I was here, I saw Eddie Pepitone say uh, he was doing a bit, but he said, 
Uh, if you if you like sport, if you are a big fan of sports, you should read a fucking book. <laughs> I, you know, I'm I, I I'm semi on board with that sentiment. Sorry. Uh, there's a funny John Cena sex scene. Yeah, the uh, dirty talk scene is pretty funny. Yeah, he, but that's the thing. But it, kind of, but it oh, God, I'll get in. I'll get into this. But I want. I really want to hear. Why you hate it? Well, okay. What, so you ha- you're going. You got all these expectations. Right. It's funny up front. First twenty minutes doing it for you. Bill Hader shows up and everything goes completely downhill for the next hour and forty minutes, which is a long movie. This hour, this, this movie's, movie's two, two hours. Two hours. <laughs> and it just keep gets your comedies in an hour and a half. So increasingly lame. You have. These weird, like the athletes are, LeBron James is cheap. So every scene, he's going to make jokes about being cheap. And John Cena's gay. And this is this recurring callback thing that it never, they're not funny. They're sports people. They don't know how to deliver. They don't know how to riff. There are long segments where it's very clear that there's no dialogue written. Right. And it's just LeBron James talking about being a heartbroken to get on with the freaking movie yep. and none of it's funny at all. That's the pro- this the problem with the biggest problem that I had with this was the length and a lot of that is exacerbated by those classic Apatow improv scenes which work in a movie like Knocked Up or 40 Year Old Virgin where you have strong comedic performers doing the improv back and forth with each other. It doesn't work in a movie when you have people who don't know how to be comedic, improvisational, trying to run those scenes back and forth with each other. Yeah, the whole long list of people we listed, of they're not the ones doing the comedy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what the hell? Exactly. <laughs> and then you have all these montages. There's like a sex montage and a falling in love montage and a fight montage and a being lonely and sorry montage. Okay, oh, can we just get on with it again? That's that's four montages for those keeping Dragon Home don't forget in about, a two hour movie. Don't forget, yeah, don't forget about the montage where Amy Schumer throws all the alcohol out of her apartment. Oh, the alcohol tossing montage! I forgot. Classic alcohol tossing <laughs> montage goes on. T- how many montages do you need in a movie? Oh, too ma- this is too many. My God, um, and her character is just such an asshole. <laughs> like. <laughs> There's, you know, Bill Hader's this well respect, <clears throat> respected uh, sports uh, surgery, I guess, doctor, yeah, whatever the medicine. science is, whatever. Uh, works with Doctors Without Borders, a nice dude. And she's just such an asshole to him. She, like, leaves during this important speech and picks a fight with him uh, the day before his giant career making or breaking surgery. Yeah. Who? What? Why would you? They're just, she's like, oh, you can have a uh, million other women. I'd not, and like, yeah, he definitely could. Yeah. You're a raging asshole. Uh, at one point, she's like, but he's my best friend. Uh, do you have you had friends in your life ever? There's no way this really nice, really smart dude is going to be with this lazy drunk. Now, this is supposed to be where her big transformation is. And the arc of the movie where she, you know, becomes a better person because of love and blah, 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 blah. Uh, which apparently she does by uh, redeeming herself dancing with cheerleaders. At, right? at yeah. an empty Madison Square Garden is her big turnaround from being a drunk asshole. And don't forget, <laughs> don't forget that Pratt fall where she jumps on a trampoline and then falls face first into a mat. <laughs> oh, you're back! Another, mo- another sort of montage. <laughs> it felt like a montage. It lasted too long. Why uh, did we, Why did we have to go through five songs? Like, and then another two songs after that. Even Bill Hader's character's like, you don't need to keep doing this. <laughs> That's how much this movie went on for too fucking long. The when char- the characters <laughs> in the movie are like, all right, cut, you can cut this shit a little bit. We can, cut, we can get out of here earlier. Yeah, it's like, hey, I danced with the cheerleaders I made fun of earlier in a completely empty arena in front of you. I'm a whole new person. What? What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, the and uh, another great terrible montage. Oh, is Amy Schumer going to make it to the to this, the Madison Square Garden on time montage? To dance in front of no to what why why is she racing to get there if she knows that she's not going to do anything until the the game is over why is she racing when the game is starting to be like oh my god I got to make it on time basketball games last at least an hour 
Wait, was if she, not two hours. I just was she maybe trying to make it for halftime, and she was late again, that which just proves she sense. doesn't. I don't. I didn't write it. I don't know. There's a lot about this movie that doesn't make sense to me. I think. Look, I think Amy Schumer, as far as comedically, she should have stuck to sketches. I think long form. It's all structured weird, and it's all out of place, and it go. It's just it's just too long, and I don't know how much of that came from the director's side. I don't know how much of it came from the writer's side, but I can tell you this: if you are going to write a movie involving the death of one of the characters' dads, and that's not the crux dramatically of even in a rom com, you can have that be like the big turning point moment. It's basically just another like dumb plot point where they're like, where it literally happens where where I think it's her sister and she's like, "Dad died." Whoops! Oh no! <laughs> she when Amy's given the speech about how much her dad meant to her, she drops the f bomb and, and no one like bats an eye. And in the cemetery, I'm like, "Does anyone?" She just said, "Fucking talking," and we're all just boo hoo hoo. Yeah. Um. She dr- uh, anyway. Look, like if that's okay. If that's the reason why you go and you get into, if you pick a fight with your with your boyfriend while you're grieving actively, like the day of your dad's funeral or something, yeah, sure, I get that. That makes sense. What doesn't make sense to me is like, oh, we're gonna start a fight because I had to go take a phone call. Oh no, that's the end. The end of our relationship. It's, something's gone wrong here. It structurally just didn't make sense to me. It's just like. It's just there's so there's so much about this movie that bugged me too. I watched it. I had hopes. I don't see, and there's a part of me that thinks maybe I don't know if I like rom coms anymore after watching this movie. Oh no! All I watch is documentaries and Phantom Thread. Apparently, I watched Big Sick and I felt this. I was like, I don't think this is the big. I don't think the Big Sick is as bad as Trainwreck by any means. I think the Big Sick is better than Trainwreck. But I also watched it and I was like, okay, yeah, this is fine. I think that Trainwreck fell into this trap that romantic comedies tend to fall in every couple of years where a movie will come out and all the critics will be like, oh, this is changing the way that we're going to look at romantic comedies forever. It's a it's female driven written by a woman. It's vulgar. It's raunchy. She's talking about fucking. She fucks a 16 year old in the movie almost. OK, so here's where. OK, so all the stuff we discussed is just bad filmmaking. That's where it gets really personal for me. <laughs> This is that was part one. This is part two. Oh man, I didn't even know. <laughs> so, as a female journalist, uh, yeah, she's a, almost fucking the sixteen-year-old intern assistant guy. Uh, as but one of, I have a whole page of stuff I hate about how she portrays herself as a female journalist. <laughs> oh, let's go into it. <laughs> or also just the ludicrousy of, uh, for example, let's start at the top. Uh, she knows nothing about sports, nothing about medicine, yet editor Tilda Swinton takes the story away from the guy who pitched it, gives it to her. Nope, not going to happen. That's not a thing that would happen ever in journalism. Uh, she meets up with them for the first time to go over their schedules <laughs> so they can plan to have interviews. What are you? You meet, you go to, we're going to talk about meeting. No, he ain't got time for that shit. She ain't got time for that shit. Ludicrous. And then she's like, I'll just talk to your receptionist about when we can set up the interviews. Okay, so what was this entire scene for? And so we can have LeBron James show up and say, oh, I forgot my sunglasses. I'm going to try and make some lame jokes about Sunglass Hut. I'm cheap. I'm cheap. Uh, When she starts the story, she acts like a deliberate asshole the entire time, not even a shred of trying to be professional. She's making fun of his scientific equipment. You're writing a story about don't – you're not going to be mean to his face. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I'm getting so upset. Um, It's okay. Get upset. (laughs) This is not good. Get upset. Their first interview session turns into last call at a bar. And then she goes to his house and has sex with him. And he's clearly <sighs> the best. The the I think that Bill Hader is probably one of the best parts about this movie because he is the only person who's kind of acting realistic at all for a lot of it, and and puts up with Amy Schumer as a, a an insane trying to not be a slut chick 
and there's that part when she gets into the cab and he's like, two stops. <laughs> She's like, no, 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 no. We're going to your place. And Bill Hader looks so <laughs> uncomfortable. And it's great because I there was a part of me that was like, you should just kick her out. You should just like kick her out of the cab. You should just take her, send her somewhere else. And he's just, and he just sits there. He looks around. I mean, look, I went to journalism school at the University of Missouri. Before they even let you in, you have to do a year of pre journalism school classes. Uh, the first one is ethics. Mm hmm. <laughs> You have to learn an entire semester of ethics of journalism. Um, you don't act like an asshole to the dude and get drinks with him and go sleep with your interview. What are you? What? Fire up. Immediately fireable offense. Yep. Believe oh, that. my God almighty. Uh, she tells the assistant guy she doesn't bother using a tape recorder when she does interviews. Uh, like, and she's telling him you can't be drunk. You can't fuck people. And while she's doing it. With Bill Hader and later him. And it's just so disappointing to me that, like, um, the fact that uh, she, oh gosh, I'm, and I'm even skipping ahead on my list, uh, where he's first like, I think we like each other and we should be a couple as the story's happening. And she's like, no, I'm a writer. I have big plans. Bitch, you fucking have no, you, you have, you, with your drunken and whoring around, you're not home writing. You're not home working hard on anything. And she's working on this story about him uh, at least six weeks when her dad dies. And so it was probably about two months by the time Tilda Swinton went and pegged it. Uh, but it's like, okay, she's a staff writer at this magazine. She has this one story she's working on for two months. Nope, not happening also. You have to be working about 10,000 stories at the same time. And she's not even doing it. Yeah, you got plans, my ass. You have plans. Uh, she brings him to the cemetery with the entire magazine staff there for her dad's funeral. None of them bat an eye? This is so wildly unrealistic. Again, seeing him with her, immediately fireable offense. Yeah, problems. Oh, my God. Um, so she finally does, like, get the story placed in Vanity Fair, and the whole thing's about how she used to be drunk and eating cheese fries, and she turns it first person because she's falling in love. And, like, no, Vanity Fair's not going to run this garbage. No. This is some ridiculous. This is some babe.net. <laughs> Let's put that up it there. It is. It's, it is. It's like the babe.net version of journalism. My God, you're right. Yeah. Uh, the, it could have been redeemed by, you know, there's a couple moments in like The Devil Wears Prada, for example, which is also a romantic comedy where you have like, yeah, journalism's hard, but it's a Dr Stanley Tucci talking about, think about the little kid reading the magazine under his covers in Idaho or whatever he's talking about. It's a beacon of hope. It's like, yeah, there's there should have been some of that. Or at the end, um, where Meryl Streep is like, you know, you this is the life we choose. We have to be dedicated to this role we play and not deviate from it. And it's hard, and I see that in you. She's like, no, I'm not. It's not me. I'm going to throw my phone in the fountain. But you get a little bit of insight beyond just the – Paris fashion nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. None of that is in train wreck at all. Uh, they actually pay more attention to the sports medicine than journalism, which is his job, not her job. And that's kind of offensive to take the female protagonist job less seriously than the male love interest job. You know, something that I read about this movie, and I think it would have been a more interesting character choice in the original draft. Amy Schumer was supposed to be a used car salesman. Wow. That would have been – I would have loved to see that movie. How did that get to a female journalist? Wow. Who knows? I guess they're trying to make it a more respected, quote-unquote, profession. But it was – they didn't. They, they trashed right. They yeah. trashed the shit out of it. And this was like three, two and a half years ago at this point of – journalism wasn't in as sorry a state as it is today, but it was still pretty freaking bad. And that's just, I think, so irresponsible mm -hmm. to portray a stereotype like that to your young teenage girl fans who are coming to watch this movie because of you and the dudes who are coming to watch it because of the sports figures. Yeah, because you got Tony Roma in there and you can go see this movie. Like, you have an opportunity to do a little bit of rah-rah, you know, go girl power, and 
there's like none of that. There's no compassion or common sense or solidarity from someone who has had a difficult time being taken seriously as a female comedian. Like, show the same to a female journalist. Like, where... I just feel like she should have known better. Yeah. And I hate to say it, because I... Like, I I know Amy as a person and like her and respect her and think she's been great for comedy in a lot of ways, but... Yeah, don't like the train wreck. It's just... It just doesn't... (laughs) It just just doesn't work. And, you know, I'm with you. I think that... You know, I I have been a fan of work that Amy Schumer has made. I think that uh, a lot of the stuff she did on Inside Amy Schumer was really great sketch writing. Um, the the Twelve Angry Men episode is out and out brilliant, but her talent just doesn't translate in Trainwreck. She comes across as so unlikable. The movie is is I think poorly written, poorly structured, and and falls prey to bad filmmaking. Not funny too long. Not funny too long. It's not happy. Like you don't leave it like yeah, I'm gonna go conquer the world. And you're like mmm, I don't like stuff. Yeah, this movie. It's just like is, is this what is this what falling in love is supposed? Oh my god, <laughs> it's this is and no and it's such a negative romantic comedy. Yeah. Romantic comedy is supposed to be uplifting. They're supposed to, they are supposed to make you leave theater feeling kind of good. And this is just like, I don't feel good about this at all. I feel like they're going to end, this is going to end in a, in a horrifying divorce and somebody's gonna, somebody's apartment's going to get set on fire. For sure. Yeah. There's no way it's going to work for them as a couple. going to get alcohol poisoning. There's like, like a tell and Mike Berbigli are the best parts and the rest of it. I just can't, can't stomach David, watching David Tell it. is great in this movie. I love him. <laughs> he's he's a bright, shining beacon. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, you know, to wrap up, is there anything that you think that this movie could have done differently to make it a little bit better? Oh, it sounds boy. like the best, the from uh, from what you've, uh, criti- the criticisms you've levied at it, it seems like a, a, a big obvious one would be to change the way that journalists are portrayed to give them a little bit more uh, – to make – I don't know, just to make it more realistic. She could have been a really good journalist and still a mess. Yeah. She didn't have to be both. Yeah. That would add a bit more context and layers to the whole – I mean, yeah, it's like – it's kind of like being a comedian and uh, you're going to have – a really tough life and things you want to do uh, through this sort of creative prism. And uh, there are consequences for that in your personal life, or maybe you turn to substances, blah, 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 uh, to actually show it in a more heartfelt manner, as opposed to just across the board, lame. (laughs) Yeah. I think best thing to do to keep this one from being a, from being a train wreck Shorten it. <laughs> Cut out half an hour of this movie. Oh God! And the yeah, the riffing with the sports guys. You don't need let to the do comedy it. people do comedy. Yeah. Uh, also, I would like to shout out uh, to your hometown, the St. Louis Film Critics Association, who decided to give this the best comedy film award in two thousand and uh, in two thousand nine. I think. What they no? I, yep. Yes. Well, that's why I don't oh, live sorry. in Missouri anymore. 2009, what am I saying? This came out in 2015, so 2016. Two whole years ago, they said this was the best comedy movie of the year. So. Were there any other comedy movies that year? Uh, I'm going to find out right now. St. <laughs> Louis Film Critics Association? There probably were, in December of every year. I bet it was a bunch of sports dudes. Yeah, maybe. Uh, that's probably why. As soon as they saw Marv Albert in there, you know, like, oh, yeah, we're going to give this, this, you know, Amy Schumer, she gets us, guys. <laughs> she, she's understanding. Um, uh. Julie, thank you for uh, for sitting in this cage of hatred with me about Trainwreck. <laughs> um, it's been a pleasure to have you on. But it's fun to, like, I don't feel hatred to it. I just feel, like, um, I don't know, defensive of it, – it, it puts me on edge about me, about how people see me. Like, it's tough for me in the com- – I know you just said goodbye, but I'm going to go on this whole other rant. Like, it's tough to be taken seriously, and I would like to see Amy Schumer show a similar – uh, respect. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, I take you seriously, Julie, and I think all of my listeners should. Julie is a, a wonderful comedy journalist, and uh, where can they find your work if they haven't read much of it? 
Yes, uh, I have about a billion clips up on juliesebaugh.com. Seabaugh is S-E-A-B-A-U-G-H. It's the same on all the socials. I just did a big, uh, in January for my 15th anniversary, uh, look back. I posted an old clip every day. And kind of talked about what was happening uh, when I was writing it. There was everyone from, like, uh, Carlin to Mark Marin to the history of Comedy Central to the Amy Schumer variety cover mm-hmm. I did six months before Trainwreck came out. Uh, yeah, a whole wealth of stuff there. And, uh, yeah, I'll also be uh, sitting in the back room of a comedy club near you. Yeah. Big fan, by the way, of the uh, of that Comedy Central oral history. That's one of my favorite uh, bits of yours. Ooh, and, yes. of course, the, the Roast Battle cover story you did for LA Weekly. Yeah. Which I currently have that issue framed in my room. Aw. Because uh, just that article, oh, that meant so much. Um, <laughs> let's uh, connect on social media for you and me. If you guys are on, uh, check me out at Diet J, Twitter and Instagram, jlightcomedy.com for show dates. Uh, I'll be in Los Angeles for the rest of the week uh, and the foreseeable future. I'll let you guys know if I'm doing any other spots elsewhere. Please uh, subscribe on iTunes. Give us some ratings. Uh, It'll help us out. And uh, I hope that the Eagles uh, beat the shit out of the Patriots today. I guess we'll find out tomorrow. Guys, uh, this has been another episode of Blockbusting. Go see something good for a change. (laughs) 